So let's welcome in Billy Walters. He's the author of Gambler, Secrets from a Life at Risk. Billy, it's Maggie and Perloff. Can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you, Maggie. Listen, congratulations on the book. And we got a lot of questions for you. But first, I got to ask you, so about how many times did a gun or a knife get pulled on you, Billy? <laughs> because I lost track as I was reading your book. Well, uh, too many times, but... Uh... I only had guns pull on me about three times. Uh, I had a knife pull on me a couple times. And for people who don't know a little bit about your story, uh, sports gambler and one of the most successful sports gamblers, uh, you know, that we know of. And But that's not how it all started for you. You kind of started as like a hustler. You held a million different jobs, kind of hard scrabble upbringing in Kentucky. And what eventually got you to the heights of the sports gambling world that you eventually achieved? Really, Maggie, when I got out of, out of high school, uh, I went straight into uh, business. I had no, no opportunity to get a formal education. I was married and I had a daughter. And I, I had a couple of jobs, but I went straight into the automobile business. I was in the automobile business for 16 years. And the entire time I was in the automobile business, I, I made a lot of money, uh, didn't accumulate any. I lost it all gambling. I lost it uh, uh, playing poker when I got off from work at night with pros. Uh, uh, Sunday with guys who practice all week playing golf or betting sports. Uh, essentially, just you know picking teams like the average better does today, or the or the or the or the, or the guys taking up sports the first time. I literally had no chance to win. I love the action and I uh, really enjoyed it. I also had an issue at that time, Maggie, in my life with alcohol. I didn't realize that I had a problem with alcohol because I didn't drink every day. But when I did drink, I would get uh, hammered. And when I got hammered, my personality changed, or my judgment changed, and I did some uh, very stupid things. And as a result, I uh, made a lot of money. didn't accumulate any money. My family lived well uh, financially. But, uh, but again, I, I, I love the automobile business. I was in it, did very well. But my first love was really gambling. It, it has been since I was a child. Billy, the title of the book is Gambler Secrets from a Life at Risk. But I've read in many places you, you've been called the greatest sports gambler of all time. So to me, I, I wonder, you know, there's less risk in actual sports gambling for you than others. So the title uh, was a little confusing in that sense. Could you take out a lot of that risk when you were at the top of your game? Well, uh, I had... You know, 25 of the smartest people uh, in the in the sports world working for me. I had seven of the brightest guys that, uh, in the business working for me independently. I spent millions of dollars uh, every year on research and development, and uh, I had a large number of people, you know, involved. So that's the way I was stay, able to stay out of the game is because of that. Uh, and I realized in 1985. You know, I, I began in you know, my sports betting career. I was a handicapper, you know, with a pencil and piece of paper like most guys in those day, days. And I met Mike Kent, who developed the first computerized sports betting program, and eventually we became partners. Uh, initially, there was a group of people, and there were some things that happened. And initially, uh, then, then eventually it was just he and I. But I realized in 85 that, you know, his, his advantage was eroding. And I realized that if I didn't continue to reinvent myself, you know, my sports betting career wasn't going to last a lot longer. That's when I went out and recruited these independent people and spent and committed to spending millions of dollars uh, yearly uh, to upgrade the system and to basically stay ahead of the game. Uh, if I hadn't, I would have been, you know, I would have been out of business a long time ago. Every handicapper I've ever worked with, uh, after a period of time, they've all lost their edge. They ran out of ideas. You know, technology's caught up with them. Information's caught up with them. Uh, the market, people, you got more people today. You got, you know, very smart people. And everyone's trying to find and identify value. And uh, so the competition's gotten greater. It's, it's keener. And uh, But, yeah, you know, I think it's a combination of I got a lot of qualitative experience, which a lot of handicappers don't have. You know, a lot of guys can write programs and, you know, they can spit out some numbers. But. The qualitative side of sports betting is extremely important also. I've actually had some guys that work for me. That's all they did was a qualitative side of it, and they were successful. And uh, so long answer to a short question, but that's the way I've been able to uh, maintain my advantage over the years.
Billy Walters is joining us. The new book is Gambler, Secrets from a Life at Risk, uh, written with Armin Katayan, who is fantastic. And we know, Billy, you were subject of a 60 Minutes profile uh, earlier, several years ago, and then now has led to the book. Okay, so one of the things that's being talked about quite a bit is your partnership with Phil Mickelson, which was, by all accounts, Billy, pretty successful over the five years that you guys partnered together. Um, you know, how was partnering with Phil Mickelson different than other partners that you had over the years? Uh, Maggie, I'm sorry, sorry, excuse me, excuse me. He was clearly uh, extremely famous. And over the years, I, I've done business with a lot of partners, and uh, uh, and I've done that, you know, for a business reason. And Phil, uh, we had a five-year betting relationship. We had an eight-year friendship. Uh we played golf, and uh, I felt like that Phil and I had become friends. And, uh, yeah, I think I've always kind of judged myself as being a pretty good judge of character. And I think, you know, uh, when I learned we weren't as good of friends as I thought we were, I think it hurt me a lot. And uh, and uh, But our betting relationship was, you know, prior to Phil and I starting the relationship, he had been betting sports for a, a large, you know, a long time since, you know, I know of going back to 95. And, uh and I don't think, you know, he, he hadn't done well. And uh, when we started our partnership, well, we we were successful financially. And uh, we made, you know, made some money. The bookmakers we were betting with were the same bookmakers that he had lost a lot of money to over the years. And after a period of a number of months, they cut him off. They said, look, we know these bets aren't yours. Uh, and But you can start betting with us again if you'd like. And uh, and he, he he reactivated another bookmaker he'd had for a period of time, and we, he, we continued our relationship on. We were betting the one bookmaker to the two, and then uh, you know the uh, that was essentially our relationship. And then we both got involved into uh, uh, an investigation into an insider trading case. As a matter of fact, here in New York, and uh, the SEC was asking Phil questions, and uh, we were obviously being asked questions, and and uh, Phil and the in the investigation, uh, the SEC took the Fifth Amendment. And when I learned of that, I was really surprised because <clears throat> he, had, he had nothing to hide. He already told me he had met with the FBI on two occasions and told him emphatically that I did not give him inside information. So when I confronted him and asked him why he didn't answer those questions for the SEC, he had another case that he was involved in with two other gentlemen uh, where he'd wired the one guy $2.8 million. Uh, and for him to forward it on and to wire it offshore to pay a gambling debt, a gambling debt for Phil, and uh, he, uh, his concern with that is that's really don't want to answer any questions. He was concerned he would ask him some questions about that. I pointed out to him at the time. I said, "Look, you know, now that's a separate investigation. This is nothing more than less about stock trades. I mean, you know, please just answer no questions." And it didn't happen. And and eventually, I ended up uh, being indicted and. Uh, and then Phil uh, ended up uh, the money back he earned that, that he paid that he earned he paid it back, and uh, and basically the perception was created out there that you know with the public is why would a guy give a million dollars back in the stock trade if there wasn't something wrong with it? Either he bought his way out or or he was an innocent victim in an insider trading case. But regardless, it made me look guilty, and unfortunately, uh, it, made, it made me look guilty in the eyes of the public. So when I came to New York to go to trial, newspapers here, there was a lot of, you know, writing about Phil Mickelson coming to the trial. Uh, and, you know, all those stories were up on the Internet. So I'm sure the people on the jury had questions about when he was going to testify. As a matter of fact, a couple of prospective jurors, they asked if Phil Mickelson was going to testify. So when I went to trial, Maggie, there was one fellow who testified against me. His name was Tom Davis. Uh, two years prior to me being charged, he had given a voluntary interview to the FBI and the prosecutors and told them emphatically I did not give him any inside information. I'm sorry, he didn't give me any inside information, excuse me. And then what happened is the authorities continued to investigate him, and they learned that he had embezzled some money from a battered women's charity. He'd filed a fraudulent tax return, and he had actually given inside information to someone else. So two years later, he went and decided that 
he would be willing to change his story if he could get off. And so he hired an attorney here, a former prosecutor. He went in and he had 29 meetings with the FBI and the prosecutors to finally get his story the, the way it worked. And then, so when I went to trial, I actually made a mistake, Maggie. I should have testified in my own trial. Yeah, but they generally happened? don't. Wait, sorry, Billy. I just want to make sure for our audience they're understanding here exactly what's going on, um, sure. which is that you get indicted for insider trading. You're hoping that Phil Mickelson will testify and will basically exonerate you because you believed he had this information that could have exonerated you. He decided not to because he didn't want to be under oath because he had other you know, legal things out there and his lawyers advised him not to take the stand. And because of that, you went to prison for, what was it, three, about three years or so? I got a five-year sentence, Maggie. Yeah. I, I did 31 months in prison. I was released because of COVID. Got it. And I, I got out on COVID, and then I was on a home confinement for a period of time. Then President Trump uh, gave me a commutation that wasn't a pardon and commuted a few months off of the home confinement. And then I went straight to probation. And... Uh, uh, you know, President Trump, I've never met him. I've never done any business with him. I didn't contribute to his campaign. So, you know, usually when you see these type of things happen with high-profile individuals, you know, there's always some thought about a relationship. I had none with him. As a matter of fact, uh, I voted for his opponent in the election. And uh, But uh, the merits of my case, again, I don't want to consume your, your show with the merits of my case. It's in the book. There's all kinds of government misconduct in the case. A lead FBI agent who's in charge of the entire case for three and a half years prior to my trial. He was suspended from the FBI. The judge who was presiding over the case recommended he be indicted for criminal contempt and obstruction of justice, two felonies. And then when it came time, once we got in trial, the prosecutors described him as being so dishonest and, and so untrustworthy you couldn't believe anything he said. So one of the points I make in the book is when the jurors went back and they decided my my fate, they were unaware of any of that. Uh, they weren't allowed to know that uh, during the trial. And there were a couple, three other things. But back to Phil. Yeah. All I wanted Phil to do was come forward and just tell the truth. As he told me, he told the FBI on two different occasions. And he told me he would. And in the 11th hour, he didn't do it. Yeah. And uh, I went to prison. And I guess I had 31 months to think about it. And, you know, my daughter committed suicide while I was in prison. And. Once she committed suicide, uh, I knew then, you know, based upon, you know, sports betting being legalized in the majority of the United States, so many new people and average bettors are going to get involved betting sports and understanding sports and the way I do. I wanted to write it for that reason, but more importantly, I had to write it to help other people who I've had addictions in my life when I was younger with alcohol, with with, with gambling, and uh, uh, luckily I've overcome them. I, I, I caught the lottery. I married an incredible lady almost 47 years ago. And, and uh, so anyway, uh, I wanted to share that with people. And, uh, and again, Phil's only part of the story. He's two chapters of 28. And essentially what it really boils down to is two guys who had a business relationship uh, that one guy thought they developed a real friendship. And when that one guy needed someone to come forward and just be a stand-up guy and tell the truth, uh, the other guy wouldn't do it. And, uh, well, Billy, the, the, sorry to cut you off. The, the interesting, one of the interesting parts, though, is about the, the phone call you got from Phil where he wanted to bet $400,000 on the United States, basically on himself, to win the Ryder Cup at Medina. And it ended up becoming an epic failure for the Americans. So if he had bet that money, he certainly would have lost it. I mean, do you think you can say with certainty that Phil Mickelson has never bet on himself? I, I can't say with uh, certainty almost anything, but I can. I will tell you this: in the entire relationship I had with him prior to that, and the, and and after that, there was never ever any mention of him betting on golf or anyone else on golf or anything else. I got this call, and frankly, I was shocked when I got the call. And he wanted to bet four hundred thousand uh, dollars on the U.S. team to win the Ryder Cup. I mean, and I, 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 my first question was, "Have you lost your mind?" I said, don't you realize you're modern? You're looked at as a modern-day Earl Palmer, and don't you realize what happened to Pete Rose? And I said, you know, I don't want any part of it. And uh, we, you know, that was pretty much. He said, okay, okay, and we hung up. That was it. So, uh, based upon, you know, based upon the the conversations we'd had, all the betting we did on other sports prior to that, and after that, 
I doubt if he ever bet on golf. Uh, and I never allegedly bet on golf. You know, they issued a, a, a crafty uh, response to that. He, he said he never bet on the Ryder Cup. I never said he did. Uh, but he never said he didn't attempt to bet on the Ryder Cup. And that's what's in my book. Yeah. It's a fascinating book, uh, Billy. It is. I'm sorry that we're flat out of time. We have to get to a break. Uh, quite a life you've led, sir. I mean, it really is. And uh, it was really entertaining. Again, the book is called Gambler, Secrets from a Life at Risk. The sports betting is part of it. Playing golf with Michael Jordan. Mm-hmm. How much you take from Jordan? I like I like I, I like the MJ a lot. He's really down to earth, very nice guy, extremely competitive, and the interaction I have with him, he's nothing but a class act. <laughs> Didn't uh, answer the question, Billy. How much money you take from, or did he take it from uh, you? Believe it or not, we played for a grand total of eight uh, for a hundred dollars on eighteen holes, and uh, I actually did win a hundred dollars. But that was our total bet. Uh, that either one of us had a risk was a, was a $100 bill. And uh, that's what we played 